welcome to this episode of Law Girl. I'm Jasmine Dea coming to you from my personal injury law firm, JD & Co., located in the heart of Midtown Toronto at Young & St. Clair. Joining me is Elia Lapowicz, owner and director of Innovative Case Management, Inc., a company that provides case management services. Prior to founding the company, she worked as a case manager, vocational counselor, and cognitive therapist. Ellie holds an honors degree in psychology and holds several certificates in fields related to rehabilitation. Ellie, thank you so much for coming by my office today. Thank you so much for having me. My intention of inviting you over was to discuss personal injury in the context of rehabilitation services, but before I delve into that topic, tell us about yourself. How did you decide to pursue a degree in psychology? Thank you for your question. It's actually pretty funny. Um, in grade eight, I took a biology class with Mr. Kogut, and he got me very interested in the brain, and my interest in working with traumatic brain injury grew from there. How did you learn about case management services, though? Like, so you start with psychology, mm -hmm. and how did you get to case management? So I completed a degree in psychology and then a rehab certification through the York Seneca program. And when I graduated, I worked as a rehabilitation support worker. Um, and I had the opportunity to work under the direction of some amazing case managers. Um, and that made me realize how important a role it is and really got me thinking about how I could best affect change and help my clients. And we're going to define further in a bit what exactly case management is, because I think it's a mystery to most people. I personally had no idea what it was until my first few years of practice when I learned um, through files that my superior had that were very complicated files and had case managers. So we'll get to that. But just before that, one other question I have is you, you've started this company in 2004. How did you take the leap to starting your own company? Um, funny enough, I actually was two months pregnant and decided it was a really good time just to sort of make that leap entirely. Um, but basically, I wanted to create a company where everyone had the same philosophy and set of values in their approach to working with accident victims. I also wanted to give back to the community as much as I could. And starting ICM gave me a platform to increase my involvement with multiple, multiple brain injury groups. So wait a sec. You decided when you're two months pregnant? I did. <laughs> That is something we don't hear often. Know, a bit of a risk, but uh, I haven't looked back since. So it's all worked out. It has. That's good to hear. Uh, so when people think about personal injury, I think that most people believe that I just handle car accident claims, which as you know, is obviously not true. I do a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of claims, a lot of injuries that are outside the scope of car accident claims. But for today's podcast, I wanted to discuss case management and I wanted to discuss it more in the context of car accident um, claims because I think that's where you see most case managers. Mm -hmm. uh, so what what is case management? So case management um, basically works to coordinate medical and rehabilitation services being provided to clients after a motor vehicle accident. We don't actually provide any hands-on care or intervention, but we instead manage a team of therapists and doctors. A good analogy is, is the conductor of an orchestra. So we don't actually play any instruments. We just make sure all the other musicians are playing together and sound as best as possible. I like that analogy. Thanks. Actually. So when I use case managers, um, I, I think for me that it really takes the weight off my shoulders because for me, when I have a complicated case, my clients need me to get all the paperwork in order. Mm -hmm. They don't know all the paperwork that's getting done, but it's a lot. And so my focus has to go on that. And I need someone to help coordinate those services. And while, you know, I would love to be a part of that, it's hard to juggle both. And sometimes also I may not know, uh, you know, the right people for some of these individuals because I'm not in the healthcare field. Right. I'm the lawyer on the mm -hmm. file. So that's your job. That's where you come in. Right. When I think of case managers and case management, when I'm handling a car accident claim, or as you know, in legal terms, we call it a motor vehicle accident claim. When my client has sustained a catastrophic impairment, I generally, I'm going to call the case manager first. Why do I do that? Do you know why I do that? Absolutely. 
Um, so we're often the first, first providers in the door. Um, we provide a lot of support and education to clients and their families. We work on assembling a community treatment team to ensure that the client's needs are being met and we facilitate the discharge process from the hospital when it's time. Uh, we're also helpful in allowing clients to be deemed catastrophic by helping um, the team and you guys as well as the lawyers to collect the necessary documentation and help with getting the forms filled out to kind of help the entire process along. So in terms of catastrophic impairment, we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about catastrophic as if, you know, everyone knows what that means. Mm -hmm. We've got individuals with car accident claims that are either catastrophic or not catastrophic. Right. So what is the difference? Um, how do we simplify this for individuals? Like the majority of people that are in car accidents and that sustain injuries as a result are not catastrophically impaired, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So when we say someone's catastrophic, what does that mean? How, how would you explain it? Um, it generally means that they're more severely injured. Um, they're more impaired from a functional perspective. They need more help. They need more therapy. They need more services, more equipment. Um, and in general, they just are requiring um, services over and above what someone who is non-catastrophic would need to kind of help them progress and, and go back to their pre-accident life. So in the case of a catastrophic impairment accident victim, how do you assemble the team for them? So that's an excellent question. Um, so really for us, it's more about fit than it is anything else. And when I say fit, it means um, looking at the client's injuries or impairments, where they're located geographically to help keep travel costs down, their age, their religious or cultural background, um, really just what is going to make the client feel comfortable and want to work with the therapist. Um, and what we found is when a client buys into working with a specific therapist, they progress faster because they're more willing to work hard and engage. I have learned over the years when I have claims involving catastrophic injuries and there's a team assembled, we have team meetings. For me personally, I try to be present because I feel that I understand what is happening and I feel that when there's issues, people can't always reach me the same way they can if I'm right in front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes it's a payment issue. Um, you know, the person that is, that is discussing, like the speech pathologist, for example, mm -hmm. who's discussing um, whatever they're doing in terms of treatment with my client, they're not getting paid and I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so this is their opportunity to say, oh, Jasmine, what about payment? I have been waiting. And I would say, oh, I didn't know you've been right. waiting. So it, it's helpful. And I also can gauge how my client is doing and if you know I think things need to change mm -hmm. it keeps me on board with where we are with the lawsuit and what I need to bring to the attention of defense counsel mm -hmm. do you feel that it assists in other ways absolutely I I actually love attending team meetings I find them incredibly helpful um, and really it's an opportunity for the client their family um, the treatment team and the lawyer and sometimes the adjuster if they would like to attend to sit down together and chat about a client's progress any issues that may have arisen since the last meeting um, figure out really how best to work collaboratively to move a client forward um, in terms of timing um, at the beginning of a file especially on the more complex cases we generally will try to meet every three to four months and then after that we'll generally try to expand between six to twelve months um, it's also sometimes um, helpful in the middle to have teleconferences if there's some major issues that need to be resolved so not necessarily a sit-down team meeting but more just sort of a clinical teleconference um, and in terms of having the lawyers present, it's definitely helpful because you are as much a part of the team as the therapists and the clients and their families um, in terms of keeping you informed of any progress, of any issues. And I think it really just kind of helps you get some context to the client's impairments and really frame the file. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do know, however, because of my litigation schedule, like we're booking right now, I think 10 months away. If you look at my calendar, it's pretty full. You won't find a free day, I can tell you that, until 2020. Oh. Uh, however, except the time I blocked off at Christmas with my kids. Um, however, Which I'm not going to make you attend a team meeting during. Yes, well, I wouldn't come anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Unless someone really needs me, we'll see what we can do. Uh, but that brings me to another point, which is there's one of my clients, or in the past, there's been a client and the team meetings were in Oakville. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mind attending. 
Um, but there was a couple of times I just couldn't mm -hmm. because of other scheduled attendances at other proceedings. Sure. And so while the team met, I would be on speakerphone at my mm -hmm. request. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Did that would that irritate you? You were not the case manager on the file, and it wasn't someone from your company. So speak freely. No, not in the least. I mean, I know that people have other engagements. There's you know time commitments. There's snow days, there's all kinds of issues that may interrupt with actually attending in person. And although it's my preference to have someone there in person, um, it works often just as well to have them over the phone. Um, and then if there are any issues that come up that we need your immediate attention on, um, you're there and available to respond. Okay. And in terms of a case manager, what, mm -hmm. what are the benefits of having a case manager? Um, so case managers, um, first and foremost, as I said, assemble the team and make sure that the client's needs are being met, but they also ensure that there's no duplication of services. So the occupational therapist is working collaboratively, for example, with the physiotherapist who's working collaboratively with the speech language pathologist. Um, and we generally just ensure that everyone is working cohesively towards the same goal. Um, it also allows the therapist to just be the therapist and do their job. So for example, um, on the non-catastrophic files where there generally is not a case manager, there is sometimes, but in general there's not, usually the OT takes on the role of being the OT as well as the case manager. And it's a lot of responsibility for one person to kind of manage. So when the case manager is available and, and is a part of the team, it allows the OT to just simply be the OT and work on OT functional goals burning question mm -hmm. who pays for case managers and case management services so that is an excellent question <laughs> and there, there's actually not an easy answer so what we do is we generally submit treatment plans to request funding from the insurance company we do that all the time um, more so often your OCF 18 exactly the OCF 18s and more often than not on catastrophic files or for clients who've purchased optional benefits generally speaking our services will be approved by the insurer and then they will basically foot the bill. However, in the event that we're not approved, so sometimes in non-catastrophic cases, um, lawyers will ask us to work on a protected basis, meaning a deferred payment basis, until such a time that the denied treatment plan is either resolved through um, a lap process or until the file settles. Okay, so I'm gonna break it down a mm -hmm. bit for our listeners. When we're talking about car accidents, Every single person in Ontario that has been injured as a result of a car accident is entitled to accident benefits. Those are benefits available through your insurance company and it's a no fault scheme so this is not impacting your premiums. If you don't have access to any insurance then you are going through the Motor Vehicle Accident Claims Fund which is a government fund set up. So when you, Ellie, are talking about payment or mm -hmm. in response to my question, mm -hmm. um, you're submitting the treatment plan, which is the necessary paperwork to the accident benefit insurer exactly. that is appropriate mm -hmm. in that specific case. Mm -hmm. And the insurance company will either approve or deny your services. Right. And then you go from there as yeah. to how to proceed. Mm -hmm. um, now, case management is generally only approved in catastrophic cases. Uh, so in, in non-catastrophic, it's there's not going to be a submission for an OCF-18 or would there still be? We still do. Um, it's helpful, I think, to kind of let the adjuster know that there is a need, although the client's not necessarily entitled to case management, it lets the adjuster know that there is definitely a need for it. And sometimes it actually kind of makes them realize that maybe the file's a little bit more complex than they initially thought. Have they ever paid? They do actually. So they've um, paid yes. on a non-catastrophic mm -hmm. case for case management right. services. Right. Ah, that's excellent. Yes. Happy to hear that. Me we'll talk too. more when we're not recording. I'm very curious. Yes, of course. <laughs> and we actually we don't call it case management when we're submitting on non-catastrophic files because it does specifically say in the SABs that case management is only for catastrophic files or optional benefits. So we submit as rehabilitation consultants. And although it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck some adjusters will actually be fine to approve it. Okay, and I think some adjusters recognize the need and this actually enables them to be able to approve the service, exactly. giving them the benefit of the doubt. For sure, and in right. fact, there have been files where the client doesn't have representation and adjusters have themselves called us up on complex files where the client's done catastrophic and have said, look, we realize that the file's really complex and it would be much more um, smooth to have a case manager at the helm getting all the services in place 
case and they're actually willing to pay for it, not out of the client's accident benefits. I love hearing those stories yeah. because you know, these days I'm so jaded mm -hmm. with insurers. So I'm happy to hear that there's some good adjusters Definitely, out there. For sure. Um, so there's been a significant decrease to available funds mm -hmm. for catastrophically injured victims as outlined in the Insurance Act and as accepted by the Ontario government. How has that impacted case management services and in particular your business? Sure, of course. Um, so um, definitely the issue of funding has been um, a major, major problem. So prior to June 1st, 2016, somebody that was catastrophically injured had access to $2 million in attendant care and medical rehab benefits. It's now reduced to $1 million. Um, and although it sounds like a lot of money, it's really, really not. Um, especially for those clients that have really complex medical um, and therapy needs. So what some lawyers are choosing to do is to use the OT as both the OT and the case manager, even on the catastrophic files. Um, and although in some instances this works okay, um, OTs don't necessarily love to do both because really they're dealing with the hot potato issues. They're dealing with housing, they're dealing with transportation, they're dealing with medication, uh, with any kind of crisis, and it really does not, for the most part, allow them to just be an OT and work on functional goals. So often, um, if down the road a client's been deemed catastrophic and the case manager gets onto a file two or three years post-accident, OTs are so happy to have us involved because it allows them to actually really focus on, on what they've trained to do and what they really enjoy doing. What you said about the amount decreasing, mm -hmm. and while, while a million sounds like a lot, it's not a lot. Let's, let's explain. So okay. one of my catastrophic files uh, in the past, I mean, I could take any of them really, but there's one that sticks out in my mind and it'll become clear in a sec. He was a pedestrian struck by a motor vehicle he sustained multiple fractures he sustained a brain injury he had to have many surgeries including um to his his skull like they had to remove a portion to alleviate the swelling of the brain um among many other things that i don't want to get into right now but it was it was a lot of rehab that was required a huge team of individuals had to be assembled uh, you know, from someone discussing nutrition, he was suffering. Obviously, he was a guy in his 20s from depression, so he had to have a psychologist. There was a speech uh, speech pathologist. There was ev everything, everything you can imagine this boy needed. And without that team, he would not have gotten to where he got to. Mm -hmm. He had to learn how to walk again, right. talk again, eat again, um, even going to the bathroom. You know, he had to learn how to do that again, given the nature of his injuries. And so he was burning through the funds very quickly. Mm -hmm. And because he's in his 20s, you know, what did that leave him with? And the reason that it was made worse is because he was at fault for the accident and there was no tort claim. So all he had were the funds mm -hmm. from the accident benefit claim. Right. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about, it sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot. You're right, that's all. And then he's left to OHIP and OHIP doesn't provide those kinds of services. No, it doesn't. I mean, OHIP is giving you your, we're thankful, mm -hmm. all, all of us yes, are appreciative we are, that we have OHIP, yes. unlike some other countries, like, you know, neighboring countries, um, <laughs> or one neighboring country. <laughs> so we're, we're lucky that we have the healthcare system we have, but it, it is basic it's care. It's very limited. It's not giving you all these types of services. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've given some of the types of, of services that an individual might need. Mm -hmm. Can you think of other examples, like on a team? Sure. Um, you know, I think often, especially in folks that have significant fractures that kind of long term don't heal properly, or clients that have a spinal cord injury, there's a lot of money that often needs to be spent in terms of attendant care or personal support worker services. Um, housing is a huge, huge um, mon money eater um, because, you know, in terms of doing renovations and modifications 
keys to a home that can be really expensive depending on how extensive they are. Sometimes we're actually required to build a client homes really from the ground up to meet their, their physical and mobility needs. So it, there's a lot of money that ends up getting spent sometimes on just a few key services or, or key um, pieces of equipment and it doesn't leave a whole lot of money for very much else. And as you said, Jasmine, OHIP as wonderful as, as it is, is really definitely quite limited. Yeah, and you, you raised a really good point about the home modifications mm -hmm. because um, I have a client who um, had to have her leg amputated and to make the whole home wheelchair accessible, that also has used up a lot of funds. Mm -hmm. I had another client in the past who, this was actually very interesting, it was determined that it was cheaper for the insurer to pay for a new condo uh, for this individual that was accessible for him than to do the renovations to the home. And that's actually what we ended up doing. And it was very interesting, very complicated. And there was a real estate agent who actually had done this. And it, I don't know if she made it her specialty, but mm -hmm. she helps um, individuals from you know accident claims she helps with that process finding the right home for them and doing the purchase and the insurer was quite helpful in getting that approved and i was very appreciative of that mm -hmm. turning to housing or staying on the topic yes. of housing um, after seriously injured clients are discharged from the hospital mm -hmm. they're often unable to return return home immediately right. mm -hmm. so forget the home modification they just can't go home yet right. what are their options it's a very good question. Um, it is unfortunately not a clear answer. Um, so first of all, it depends on whether or not they're catastrophic or non-catastrophic in terms of the amount of money that they have available um, for additional care. And what I mean is um, if you're catastrophic, you can have up to $6,000 a month in attendant care. If you're non-catastrophic, you have up to $3,000 a month in attendant care. And you can actually use those funds to potentially purchase a space at a retirement home as an option. Um, if you have 6000 a month, it's not that difficult to find a place. If you have 3000 a month, it's really hard to find somewhere that has sufficient amount of care and medication management and services in place to manage a client whose needs may be complex but who have not yet been deemed catastrophic. Um, another option is to have a client discharged at least short term to um, a suite in a hotel. We've done that before. I've had a client that's done that too. Mm -hmm. Particularly if we're doing some modifications at the home and it's not quite ready upon discharge. So we'll have the client stay in a suite where there is generally a kitchen and maybe an extra bedroom to have an attendant or a family member stay with them. Um, and then the last option, which is of course the most difficult to access, is long-term care, meaning um, not a retirement home, but a nursing home. And the wait lists are fairly extensive um, and are largely dependent on where the client is geographically, but also their level of care that they need. Uh, and I've seen wait lists as low as three months, which is quite unusual to have wait lists that are that short, up to eight years, um, depending on, again, the level of care. And that is in which geographic location? So in the GTA, in Toronto proper, the wait times are, they're crazy. Um, that sounds ridiculous. So what are these individuals, where are they supposed to go? If they're waiting six, seven years for long-term care, what are they supposed to do? It's an excellent question. Sometimes family members will allow a client to live with them short term. Again, sometimes it's a matter of making some modifications to their home. Um, and sometimes, you know, what we do is we will place a client in a retirement home and use their attendant care benefit for that and then try to submit a treatment plan for additional services to ensure that they're safe. So that comes out of the med rehab benefit versus the attendant care piece. That is honestly a very sad state of affairs, it is. Uh, but at least they have someone like you, Ellie, to assist them with the process. Thank you. Anyway, Ellie, thanks so much for coming by and helping us understand more about the case management process. Thank you for having me.